few minutes ago. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about the, um, uh, the past 10 years of activities on uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers. And uh, I got a lot of slides, so I'll just go ahead and get started if I can. Eh, it's not going to work. I'll just stand over here. And, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Mars Exploration Rovers, which uh, is shown here in comparison with Curiosity. So, it, you know, you can see it. It's, a, it's about the size of a golf cart as opposed to the car size of Curiosity. Uh, on the other hand, we had two of these that we sent to Mars in uh, January of 2003. One uh, named Spirit, the other named Opportunity. And... Um, they landed literally on opposite sides of the planet. And uh, Spirit uh, operated for uh, many years until about uh, 2010. And an opportunity is continuing uh, to operate. And let's see, the, um, just a, a word about Spirit. So here's uh, an, image, a, an actual image of the surface of Mars that Spirit took just before driving to where we, you see the simulated uh, model of Spirit, and it's just to give you an idea of the scale. And what happened was on about Sol uh, 1,886 or thereabouts, we were trying to drive uh, towards this bench here. We were trying to get down to these uh, hills down here to the south. Uh, they look like something out west of uh, Albuquerque, and uh, probably they were uh, volcanic features, and it probably would have been a spectacular new thing if we had gotten there. But anyway, we were trying to get to this little smooth bench to avoid all these rocks. So we were driving out across here, and it turns out right here is an old impact crater that's filled in with fluffy dust. And the fluffy dust has a crust on it, and over the years the rocks have tumbled down the slope and gotten on top of that, so it looked like a nice hard surface. So we drove on it thinking it was okay, and we broke through and basically buried the wheels up to the hubs and couldn't get out. And uh, Spirit was about 14 degrees south of the equator, so it was very important for it to park uh, with the solar panels tilted towards the north during the southern hemisphere uh, winter in order to have enough power to survive the winter and stuff. And so we were stuck here, couldn't do that. And so basically it didn't survive the, uh, the next winter. And that uh, last signal was basically in uh, 2010. Meanwhile, opportunity is still going. And right now it is Mars Day, uh, which of course, as you know, is about 37 minutes longer than the Earth Day. Uh, 3,719 since the day we landed in January of 2003. So we we just had our 10th anniversary, and you saw the 10th anniversary exhibit down at the museum. And uh, so in that time, we've basically pioneered a lot of uh, uh, things about Mars. Before these rovers landed, we had never traveled more than a couple of hundred meters on the surface of Mars. And so we didn't really get a sense of you know, the, the regional geology of the planet. But now we've driven kilometers and crossed geologic contacts and seen rocks of vastly different ages. And, essentially proven the whole idea that Mars was a lot wetter when uh, it was young and uh, it really dried out later and we can see the unconformity uh, between those um, you know, layers that were deposited and so uh, we can really uh, validate a lot of the early thinking plus they had a few things that we didn't even think about. So anyway, uh, right now Opportunity is climbing up a, a mountain range. This is actually the rim of a crater. We're actually way beyond where I'm showing here. We're way down here kind of working our way to the south, and we'll see that in a second. So, let's see. Oh, yeah, the status of opportunity. Of course, uh, after 10 years on Mars, uh, spacecraft with more uh, motors and actuators and uh, instruments than uh, any spacecraft in orbit, uh, the, uh, it's starting to show its age. One of the first things we lost was the um, uh, mini thermal emission spectrometer. The uh, Mira got too dusty for that to really uh, work, so that doesn't work anymore. Uh, there's a, a steering actuator on the right front wheel uh, so that you can actually turn the wheel that is stuck, but the wheel still works, although that wheel, like the one on Spirit, which ultimately failed, is uh, periodically showing spikes in current, so we're kind of babying that wheel as much as we can. And uh, let's see, uh, the Mossbauer spectrometer, which is good at measuring iron mineralogies, uh, had a uh, radioactive uh, uh, source for the uh, uh, activator for the emissions 
uh, with like a 232 day half-life or something. So after 10 years, there's uh, been a lot of half-lives and there's not a lot of life left in that uh, instrument. So it's basically not functional. And uh, let's see, the rock abrasion tool, the thing that we use to scrape off the surface of rocks, that has, uh, it still works, although the brush that we use to brush rocks had a, uh, got bent. Uh, it still works, but it's just not very efficient. And the, but the main limitation right now is this uh, shoulder joint on the uh, instrument deployment device, or IDD. Uh, this shoulder joint, uh, we can't move it from side to side. Uh, well, we can, but you know, there, it's kind of got an intermittent in it, so you could get stuck in one position or something. So we kind of leave it in this position. So we t try to drive up to something and line up our arm to put on things basically without having to move the shoulder. But otherwise, it works okay. And, uh, so we're uh, actually in uh, pretty good uh, condition. What about the uh, solar panels? This is a solar powered spacecraft, not a, uh, uh, a nuclear source. So uh, the deal with that is, um, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Just uh, continue with the motors. Uh, the, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the tested lifetime for the wheel revolution motors and for the, like the pan cam uh, azimuth motor and, all, and most of the other motors is like 10 million revolutions. So we've actually done closer to 80 million now. So, you know, this is kind of the answer to the question that people always ask, well, how much longer are they going to last? You know? Well, we don't know because we're all way beyond, you know, any expectation right now. So the bottom line is that we're in unknown territory and we'll see what happens. And, yeah, getting back to the power. So these are solar-powered spacecraft. And what you're seeing here is a plot of the solar energy generated by... The, uh, the solar panels uh, as a function of uh, Mars day since, in this case, about uh, Sol 3550. And so here we are uh, just a couple of days ago. We're generating 735 watt hours. And you can see it's climbing up because here's Martian winter. And of course, the sun was low in the sky. And uh, so since then, the sun's been climbing. But there's been another factor for this uh, abrupt climb. Usually, we kind of go down and kind of gradually creep up. But it's been going up steeply. And that's because uh, we have a thing down here called the dust factor. And when it's one, the panels are totally clean. And when it's 0.5, the panels are half covered with dust. And usually we're running around half covered with dust. But during the winter, while we were sitting there, the pan we kept getting these uh, panel cleaning events. We were sitting on a ridge, and apparently the wind was blowing across the ridge or something. Every day, you know, it would creep up a little bit, creep up, creep up. So we were up to 90%. And then it you know, looks like the wind stopped and it started creeping back down and getting dusty. And then suddenly it started jumping back up. So we were almost like 95% clean, putting out almost as much power as the day we landed, 10 years later. And now it's starting to slide back down again. But we're, coming, we're, we're not even to spring equinox, which is coming up uh, basically at the end of the summer, our summer. And uh, that's when you know, we start getting a lot of uh, dust devils and wind storms and stuff like that. And they tend to be the things that really clean our panels. We've never had panel cleanings in the middle of the winter. So anyway, that, that's kind of exciting times. And right here is plot of uh, the tau or the optical opacity of the atmosphere. And it shows you how much dust is being kicked up. And uh, so it was kind of creeping down for the winter. And then we kind of did a little recalibration. That's why there's kind of this little jump up in it. But uh, since uh, uh, then, it started to get a little bit noisy. And usually about 100 sols after the middle of the winter, it's like there's some crater in the southern hemisphere or something that has ice on it or something that you know, the sun finally hits that one wall or so something happens. Because about 100 sols after uh, the middle of the winter, the tau starts getting really jerky. Sometimes it goes way up. And so right now, it's still pretty nominal, and we're still good to go. And one more word about kind of statistics. Uh, you know, there have been a number of rovers on planets, uh, ranging from the recent U-2 uh, lunar uh, Chinese rover to uh, you know, early lunacods from uh, Russia. And of course, all of the Apollo 15, uh, 15 16, 17 astronauts uh, drove rovers on the surface and so on. And so this is a, uh, the, the distance in kilometers going out to 40 here. And uh, basically, the record holder has been Lunacod 2, which drove somewhere around 40 kilometers across the surface of the moon back in 73. And uh, then uh, the, the second uh, hold record holder was Jack Smith in the Apollo 17 lunar rover, which drove something like 36 kilometers on the moon. And uh, we surpassed that last summer. 
And uh, now the question is, we've, uh, we're basically right at 40 kilometers. We're within 200 meters of 40 kilometers. And, and uh, we're kind of working with the Russians and the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter guys to actually try to measure the, uh, the distance that the Lunokhod uh, 2 drove on the surface of the moon in the same way that we measured it with uh, opportunity so that we're, at, we're, you know, we're comparing apples and apples. And, uh, and then uh, shortly we'll probably have a little uh, press release that's uh, basically written both by the Russians who participated, probably like Basilevsky and a couple of other guys, and, and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, say that, yes, you know, uh, opportunity is now the uh, solar system champion for distance travel, 40 kilometers of travel. So that's like 24 miles across the surface of Mars. And then up front, I like to kind of post what, so what, you know, what, what about the mission? What have we actually learned? And uh, these are sort of the top uh, things that we've learned uh, in the course of the mission. One, we early on discovered that there were these so-called complex coatings, things that seem to coat the rocks that when you look at them, they, they kind of behave kind of like the desert varnishes like you'll see out here at the petroglyphs. But then, you know, they're, you know, instead of being high silica and stuff, they tend to be high sulfates and things like that. But anyway, that was early evidence that, you know, over the history of Mars, there's been a lot of uh, moistening of dust on rocks and painting of the surfaces of rocks with dust and a kind of powder coating uh, like mounter, <laughs> water-based powder coating, I guess. And um, so that's evidence that, you know, there's been moisture in more recent times. And then there's uh, modern water in these loose soils, like the one that uh, Spirit broke through. There are these loose soils that have crust on them. And when we analyze those soils in particular, while we were sitting there waiting to die, the, um, the uh, crust was actually leached of things that we found concentrated but beneath that. So that you know, fairly recent you know, windblown dust had itself been wetted uh, repeatedly and enough to actually leach the, uh, the crust. And then we've uh, seen extreme alteration of older rocks. And I'll show you some examples of that. You, know, you, you can see it with your own eyes. Uh, you don't even have to measure the uh, composition to see that. Uh, then the um, former groundwater tables, uh, the place that uh, Opportunity spent most of its life before it had finally arrived to, at this more exciting place that it is now, was a sandstone plains. And those sandstones were pretty much like the uh, Jurassic sandstones out here in western New Mexico. You can literally see where the water table, you know, was stranded for periods of time inside the rock. So it was like groundwater table. In fact, those little blueberries that were common, or, you know, that's classic groundwater table right there. So I mean, it, all of that indicated that. Now, another thing was uh, silica uh, that basically uh, is very similar to the type that you see in hot spring deposits. We saw that with spirit. Uh, uh, near its uh, uh, site with uh, those interesting volcanic features. And of course, uh, hot springs are like, you know, a holy grail for a lot of uh, uh, ideas about uh, early life, uh, the, a lot of nutrients, a lot of uh, uh, thermal energy and so on for uh, microbes. It's a great place for a life to originate. So we've shown that there's likely, you know, those sorts of conditions existed somewhere on Mars. We also uh, dis uh, discovered uh, iron magnesium carbonates in a an outcrop uh, that was fairly young over in uh, the uh, spirit site. Uh, at Opportunity, we also encountered gypsum veins. I'll show you examples of those. It looked just exactly like the gypsum veins you'll see out here in New Mexico. And more recently, we've encountered clays. And clays, uh, like uh, the rest of these uh, the uh, last uh, four items here, are things that really like to uh, appear in the presence of fairly benign water, not this acidic stuff that we saw in some of the later Martian environments, but water that was abundant and water that was fairly non-acidic. And so these things form in the presence of that. And that's where a lot of the organic molecules like to exist too. So all, all great discoveries that we did, had no clue about before we landed. So just a quick note about Spirit's Traverse. So this is a 500 meter scale bar here. So we landed out here in the plains. The plains are mostly basalt lava flows and they're, buried, they're kind of uh, uh, flowing up against these older hills here, the Columbia Hills. And so early on, we uh, undertook a, a death march across the uh, basalt plains here, which I thought were exciting because, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we arrived finally at the Columbia Hills here and then did a, a summiting of the uh, very peak 
and then drove down here to this place and that's of course uh, where we were headed you know that's that little peak that we were looking at in that uh, second image there uh, we were headed that way when we uh, got stopped down here but anyway we're going to go down to the surface now and look at an image right here at the contact between the plains and the hills and i'll talk a little bit about this is a concept that basically uh, most of the planetary geologists don't talk about because they, they kind of aren't coming from the field geology perspective. But to me, it is like more important than anything else we saw. And here it is. We're looking south along the contact. Here's the basalt here. And here's the older hills on the left. And here's Spirit doing a shadow selfie there. And um, the, the point is that uh, if you look at the hill on the left, there's, there's actually a cap rock on that. It's kind of a mesa, okay? So it's, uh, it, it's indicator that the surface was eroded, back wasted, and the cap rock was you know, kind of left hanging there. And so this is this very old erosion surface, but then the lava flows came in and butted up against that. So there was a long period of erosion in history before the lava flows came in. So you're looking at a long period of Martian geologic history uh, in these. And in fact, if you look at the rocks on the left, it turns out they're really water damage. There's lots of minerals that are only present uh, after a lot of water damaging and so on. And in, in, if you look at the basalts on the right, they're not quite as water damaged, but there's still some going on with that too. So, so this is a you know, long, this is like a ge what we call a geological unconformity because it's uh, representing you know, a long period of erosion between deposition of things. And also while we were on Spirit, of course, we uh, looking out across the plain, we saw these dust devils. We got hun hundreds of images of active dust devils on the surface. And they're the same size as the ones here in New Mexico. And um, they basically uh, operate the same way. Uh, so uh, the same speed, let me do that again. And uh, so they're you know, several meters in diameter and they move with several miles an hour and uh, it's, uh, they appear, you know, like 2 p.m. in the afternoon and stuff like that. So we would just sit up there on the side of the hill and start the cameras going at about 2 p.m. and capture all sorts of them. Uh, here's the outcrop where we actually uh, encountered our, uh, about 30% carbonate. So it turns out to be one of the younger rocks which kind of draping over the Columbia Hills. And it's now kind of exposed near the base. And it's uh, like a, it's what we call a lapilli tuff which in uh, volcanology is like these little BB-sized um, uh, pyroclast uh, accumulated together. So it's a, it's a volcanic tuff, but it's like cemented with carbonates. And it's fairly late in the history of the Columbia Hills. And so it's evidence that there was a lot of water and there was a lot of carbonate. And so one idea that was recently supported <coughs> and published in uh, uh, the geology was the fact that there was a... Uh, in fact, a lake in Gusev at that time, and that uh, there was a lot of dis uh, solution of uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide in the water, and basically we generated a lot of carbonates that way. Because it's iron magnesium carbonate instead of calcium, like we tend to think of here on the Earth. At Spirit, of course, we dug up the uh, ground with that uh, dead wheel that we had for a long period of time, dragging it behind us. And when we analyzed the, this soil, this is near the... Uh, the uh, home plate feature, the, uh, the end of the traverse, the uh, volcanic area where we saw the, um, a lot of la uh, lapilli tufts down there too. Uh, there was 90% silica in these uh, whitish deposits. And the only way you can do that is by concentrating things with uh, some sort of non-volcanic process, water. And in this case, hot water will do it. You basically you leach uh, everything out of the uh, rocks and leave behind silica, or you can actually dissolve silica in hot water and and deposit it somewhere else. But anyway, this was uh, essentially the conclusion for that. That was uh, kind of a major uh, discovery. So let's go over to opportunity now. So what you're looking at here is um, the boundary between the highlands of Mars, where there are all the impact craters, high elevated area, and the kind of the lowlands here, where there's lots of uh, sand basically burying everything. So it's a much younger surface. And opportunity landed down here in this sand sea and um, what uh, we figured we would have to pretty much stay in this, but after a while we realized we could actually drive over to this crater, which appears to be a piece of the highlands that's just kind of poking up through the sand. Okay, so it's, it was an opportunity to go look at the Martian highlands without actually landing on the highlands, okay? And we landed out in a nice smooth 
dull, boring sandstone uh, surface, but we were able to drive over to the rim of this impact crater, which represents rocks from the very earliest period of Mars. In fact, from a period when there was channels running across the surface of Mars that I've indicated here. This is that the- sounds easy, but how long did it take? <laughs> <laughs> Ten years. <laughs> it's like driving a golf cart, you know, down the, you know, the highway <laughs> and stopping every few days for, you know, overnight, you know. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, but it, we got there. And uh, so that's what we'll, we'll talk about mostly. I, I, I found this part infinitely boring out here, but the low temperature geochemists thought this was really exciting. And now they're kind of disappeared now that we're in real hard rocks with real geology. So anyway, yeah, the opportunity was the one that had, of course, the blueberries, you know, we did the experiment, you know, with the differencing between, you know, looking at the rock and the uh, concentrations of the blueberries and discovered that's where most of the hematite was located. And, and the blueberries are, you know, when you look at them up close with the microscopic imagery, little BB sized things that are all over the place. And that, the same thing happens here in New Mexico. There's a couple of deposits and it happens on Earth a lot. And they're called hematite concretions. And what happens is you get this massive sandstone. And you get these little iron uh, uh, minerals in there that start to basically get, they get wet as groundwater invades the sandstone and starts altering uh, the, the, uh, the, the iron, oxidizing the iron to, you know, hematite. And it sort of, you know, uh, basically expands in this little uh, um, spherical zone of alteration and results in some changes in the chemistry around the, the, the grains that are immediately in the vicinity of that that cements them a little bit harder than the rest of the rock. So what happens is as you uh, erode the rest of the rock, these are a little bit harder, so they get left behind on the surface, and so they collect on the surface. So you end up with a surface that's just littered with, you know, blueberries. And the reason we call them blueberries, obviously, is that they're just a little bit less orange than the rest of the Martian rock. So that when you do a color stretch like this, you know, they, they end up looking kind of bluish. So uh, now we'll uh, check out uh, Endeavour Crater. So again, we drove 40 kilometers down across the plains to the crater rim, which is kind of poking up through this uh, sea of sand. And so this is a really old surface. In fact, you can see the sand kind of coming in here and it's kind of flowing in here. and it's a very old crater, eroded, uh, but it's an opportunity to look at, you know, the older rocks. So we, right now we've done like 39.8 uh, kilometers. We've done about a little under six kilometers of traverse on the rim. And what's interesting is that, you know, nobody's ever walked on the rim of a morphologically preserved large complex crater before. So we don't know what to expect. We don't know what the geology of, of the rim of a crater like that is. We've never been on that before. So we're kind of like you know, exploring it. We've seen them on the ground uh, in eroded forms, but now we're actually uh, in the topographic expression of one so we can start talking about you know, the geology of complex craters from our field work on Mars here. So anyway, so you can see we kind of came down and did a little loop around a little rim segment here before the crater kind of totally got buried out here. And then we finished up and then we went down here and now we're driving along this rim we're going to continue on down through there. And just to give you an idea of the scale, here's the same traverse on the map of Albuquerque. So here's the Sandia Mountains, uh, the Albuquerque volcanoes are over here, the Rio Grande here, and I-40 and I-25 airports right here. So it would be like starting at the north end of Albuquerque, uh, up near the Balloon Park, and driving down to I-40 and then leaving I-40 somewhere before you hit uh, enter the canyon uh, uh, here at I-40 in the mountains and heading down, down south through the Kirtland Air Force Base. <laughs> so, but doing it in a, a garden tractor. Okay, so let's see. Oh yeah, another uh, thing. Here's, here's one I like to show the New Mexicans because New Mexicans know exactly how big this crater is. It's 22 kilometers across, okay? It's an impact crater, it's old, it's eroded. But we have a crater here in New Mexico that is 20 kilometers across. And you can go there. In fact, maybe some of you should do that uh, uh, for some of your explorations. And uh, you can see exactly how big this crater is. You can actually you know, look at the surface and see what we're seeing right now on Mars. The only difference is this uh, crater I'm talking about in New Mexico is a super volcano. 
uh, not an impact crater, but you know they're same. They're both still craters, and they have very similar forms. And I'm going to prove that to you. First of all, here's the the crater. Of course, it's the Valles Caldera, and that's the large supervolcano that's just west of Santa Fe. And when you drive up there, you actually end up going up this canyon, and you come out and you cross this youngest lava flow. But most people they're just driving through a forest of you know pine trees or something. But it turns out you know there's kind of rolling landscape. Well, it's the kind of the flow bands on top of the lava flow, but <laughs> anyway, you yeah, pop out here into a big open valley on the highway, and there's kind of a couple of overlooks about right here where you look out across it, and uh, it's called the Valle Grande, and most people look at this and say, wow, look at the size of that crater, <laughs> the real crater is buried out here, you really can't see, it's kind of behind the central mountain range. But anyway, uh, when you stand here and you look at the rim on either side, you see exactly what we're seeing right now on Opportunity. In fact, here's a view from Opportunity, looking uh, from uh, that, that northernmost little rim segment to the south where we are actually right now. You can see the rim kind of going around there, and there's the interior of the crater. And uh, we've driven across there, and so we're, we're way up there right now. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take you to the same place on the Valles Caldera, and show you what scale you're looking at here. Because right here, you know, you're on Mars, you don't have any references. You don't know what you're looking at, really. Is that like two centimeters across, or is it like 100 miles? Well, it's this scale. There's a highway right here, and so we're standing at the edge of the overlook. There's the uh, floor of the valley, and then the caldera goes way out this way. And so there's the rim of the crater is way up here, and it kind of comes around. So it's the same view. The only difference is these are probably a couple of hundred feet higher than the hills that you were looking at with uh, Spirit. So right now, it's, uh, I mean, with Opportunity. So right now, we're actually driving kind of along the crest right there. And I'll show you a couple of scenes looking in from up there. Well, yeah, another nice comparison is uh, there's a crater on Mars called Santa Fe Crater. <laughs> and it's obvious and uh, ironically, it's exactly the same scale as Endeavor Crater, but it's way younger. So you can actually use Santa Fe Crater as a model for you know, what is going on here. In fact, you can almost, it's almost like twins separated by birth date or something. They've got the same sort of structure, but this one's much more eroded and filled in and so on. And uh, so that, that's kind of interesting. In fact, if you look at Santa Fe Crater from the side, basically what, what, what we're doing is driving along this highest outer rim here. And the interior has just been totally flooded with sand. And the outside is flooded with sand and eroded, so that all of this left is just the rim. And so we're driving along that and trying to figure out what the heck's going on. And uh, so what's happened is uh, after arrival, uh, we've done uh, mapping along our traverse. And, and um, these maps are basically just this little rim segment here. Uh, and uh, as we drive along, we can see about 20 meters on either side and identify the the rock types or the lithology on either side, and then actually sample the, uh, the rocks. And it's exactly what you do when you go in the field as a geologist here. You, you walk along, you look at outcrops here and there, and then you may be able to uh, compare this outcrop with the next outcrop that you encounter, and you can kind of you know, start drawing lines between things. And, but as a field geologist, you're able to kind of zigzag all the way across the map, you know, and you, so you can fill in the whole square. But with us, we're, we're kind of driving along a line. We, we can't depart from that too much. So we end up basically doing what we call as a geologic strip map. And it still you know, allows us to do a lot of stratigraphy and correlation between site to site. And what you're looking at are just different colors represent different rock types. The blue is the, the regional sand that's you know, buried everything. And then there's some browns and yellows and other colors that are parts of the actual ancient rocks of the crater rim. And uh, the way we do that, of course, is as we drive along, you know, we'll, we'll do, you know, we'll look at the rocks at a place and identify them, and we'll look around us and see their characteristics. And then we drive, and we might uh, uh, bump into a contact, and we'll identify a different rock on the other side of the contact. And then we'll drive and only see the other type of rock, and then we'll drive and we'll see the contact. So then you can end up kind of draw, drawing a line between the two. And so you end up with being able to fill in your, your whole traverse line here. And uh, the reason you can, uh, uh, that's exactly the same way you do it on the Earth in an area where you have limited outcrop, lots of cover like back east where there's just outcrops here and there. You do a geologic map in pretty much the same way. Uh, but we're just doing it along a, a strip map. Okay, and uh, whoops.
too far. So here's uh, uh, sitting on the rim of Endeavor Crater, looking across 22 kilometers to the other side. Here's the near side. Here's some of the impact ejecta. This is a little tiny crater that's thrown out some of the uh, bedrock. That's why we uh, arrived here. And when we arrived there, there were these uh, deposits that were kind of flanking the, uh, the crater rim that were much older than the sandstones, but yet uh, younger than the uh, older crater rim. And within them, there were these white lines all over the place. And uh, we finally got around to looking at those white lines, and it turns out they were veins. Uh, bright veins, about an inch across, you know, and maybe a couple of feet long. And uh, the, when we analyzed them up close with the instruments, here's a microscopic imager view. You can see the scale again. It's a couple of centimeters across uh, this way and about 40 centimeters long. And there's kind of lines going through it. And boy, it looks really similar to some veins that you see here on the earth with uh, certain minerals in particular. Uh, when we analyzed this, it turned out to uh, have a lot of calcium and sulfur. And in fact, then when we broke it uh, with the wheels and looked at it with some, uh, some of the filters with the spectral characteristics, uh, there was evidence for a lot of hydration of these. So, so it's hydrated calcium sulfate, which of course is gypsum. And uh, so indeed, if you look at a terrestrial example, here's an Earth, same scale basically. Uh, and the gypsum really likes to behave like this where you get the, uh, the crystals grow along a twinning plane perpendicular to the walls as the, uh, the fracture as it opens, so you get this characteristic. So it's, <laughs> they're gypsum veins. Uh, and they're all over the place, all over that unit. And they only happen uh, up to the point where the sandstone came in. The sandstone does not have that in it. So we now know, right, from geological overlapping relationships that the gypsum event was sometime after the crater rim was eroded, but sometime before the sandstone plains came in and buried it. So it was some period of Martian history where we had enough water flowing through crack fractures and cracks to uh, deposit gypsum. But here's what the actual rocks of the ejecta look like. They look really gnarly, like these, you know, uh, very similar to the rocks you would see if you went on a cinder cone, uh, like out here at the Albuquerque volcanoes or something. Same sort of scale. But it turns out that these are impact uh, uh, rocks. They're basically semi-melted and melted and vaporized rocks all kind of uh, glommed together into this, what we call a breccia. And they're all over the place, but they're extremely altered again. If you look at them, there's a lot of hematite and a lot of other weird minerals. In fact, there's some gypsum veins, but very small ones that occur in these. So we know that the gypsum basically did happen, you know, did infiltrate some of the fat ejecta. If you look at the outcrops up close, this is like a meter across. Uh, there's these chunks of uh, basaltic rock, you know, and this kind of you know, light toned uh, submicroscopic matrix uh, that looks kind of like the bandolier ash flow tuff from the, uh, the Valles Caldera up here. But on Earth, uh, we've identified that type of rock, and, and uh, it's, it turns out to be a thing called suavite uh, that uh, you get. Uh, basically country rock that's smashed, broken up, melted, and deposited almost like a volcanic ash cloud, uh, only in big impact craters. And so this is an example from the Earth. So we've seen suavite on Mars now, too. Oh, here's a really cool thing. So, so that impact uh, I, is sitting on top of something, obviously. And it turns out we actually got a chance to actually see what it's sitting on. So this is the pre-impact surface of Mars here. And here's the contact. So this is a big unconformity. And I can show you that it's an angular unconformity. And there's a lot of time uh, before this event happens. So we're kind of looking up towards the rim here. And so this is just the, the contact exposure between the ejecta and the pre-impact. And, and the, the, the surface of this pre-impact rock, it's a very fine grain rock. You can't see any grains in it. So we don't know what the heck it is, other than that it's really altered. It's got a lot of fractures running through it. And the surface of the outcrop actually has some of those uh, desert varnish-like coatings on it that got buried by the impact ejecta. So we're talking about a paleo surface on Mars that was buried and now exhumed, and we're looking at it. So this is the surface of Mars uh, you know, three and a half billion years ago. That fact seems to have gotten lost in the translation. Anyway, if you look at the, the pre-impact rock, here's what it looks like. So it's like these you know, fine-grained rock and there's like these fractures, you know, uh, systematic pattern of fractures. And along the fractures, extreme alteration. And you'll see that on the Earth in some places. But mostly where you see it are in tropical environments. 
<laughs> because it takes a lot of water operating, you know, soaking rocks deeply for a long period of time. And, and uh, it, when we analyzed this, these were high in alumina and uh, silica, and uh, they were kind of on a trend line for uh, uh, alteration to like clay mineralogies. And uh, the rocks themselves, of course, are the typical Martian, uh, the, the background of typical Martian basaltic composition. Anyway, so th this is evidence that we had rocks that were you know, massive, uh, that, that were uh, fractured deeply, water circulated through them for a long period of time. And then, in order to get these on the surface, like you see here, we had to erode that down. God only knows, meters maybe, to get to it, that exposed. Then we put a desert varnish on that. Then we put the impact ejecta on that. So this is old stuff. I mean, this is like way old stuff. This is like holy grail stuff. And, and uh, it, here's the contact. I mean, look at that. I mean, you can see here's the, um, the line basically between the, uh, the, the rock on the left where you can see the, the, the fin-like, uh, the, 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 the fractures are actually uh, a little bit uh, harder than the, the original rock now so that they, when the wind blows things away, they kind of stand up. And then basically the, um, uh, the contact there uh, sh shows you where the eject is sitting right on top of it. And, uh, oh yeah, by the way, we, we named the, uh, the impact eject after Gene Shoemaker, so it's called the Shoemaker Formation. And then this old rock, uh, we named uh, Matijevic after the guy who basically is the father of uh, most of uh, our rovers on Mars. And uh, without him, we wouldn't have encountered this uh, rock. And so anyway, the bottom line is we kind of end up with you know, doing a geologic map by field work. And uh, we're able to measure how thick things are and the attitude of the bedding and all that sort of stuff. 